Well, good evening, everyone. So good to see you here on our final night of District Council. You know, I'm reminded uh, of when a few men approached Jesus and they said, Teacher, teach us how to pray. You know, the theme has been we are family. And there's something about the Lord's Prayer that's just communal. It's just family. So I'm going to ask you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer, and then I'll say a closing prayer after that. And I'll prompt you by saying, and Jesus taught his disciples how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, here we are, your people. Lord, there are those who have given 50 plus years to the ministry. There are those who are starting out and being ordained tonight. No matter where we are, we know that you are with us. You have called us. You have given us a charge to immerse ourselves in this calling and helping others to find God and to love one another. Lord, as these candidates for ordination tonight, as they are prayed over, as they are charged, as they are ordained, Lord, may they not forget that we are merely dirt telling dirt about the divine and that we must always rely on you personally and professionally. You are with us. Now, Lord, we know that you see us, you know us, and you care. We are yours, and we are family. In the strong name, Jesus, amen and amen. Hallelujah. What a momentous occasion. Thank God for all the candidates here. Thank you guys for being here. Let's go ahead and give Jesus another hand clap of praise. Amen. Man, what a mighty God we serve. What an awesome time we've had here at District Council. Come on, you guys can do better than that. So thankful for everyone that held doors, everyone that counted money, everyone that set up tables. We're so thankful for everyone here. You guys did a great job tonight. And I think that deserves a hand. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Well, guys, this is it. We, uh, we've reached the uh, end of the road here. And I just want to challenge you. I just want to get, get inside your heads if you guys could. If, man, if, if, if it was your last time to give God praise, if it was your last time to sing of, of his goodness, if it was your last time to just be in the midst of the saints, how hard would you go after it tonight? Something to think about. Say, man, my voice is about to go, man, but I'm going to give it everything I got. Every time I get up here, I give God everything I have because he's worthy of the praise. Is he worthy tonight? Is he worthy tonight? Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Things in your life. See 
what the Savior has done. See how his love overcomes and he has done great things. He has done great things. Our hero of heaven to come. song goes like this. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. Simple song. You are worthy. Can you sing it if you know it? You are worthy. Come on, lift your hands and sing it tonight. You are worthy. You are worthy. He's worthy tonight. You are worthy. Huh? You are worthy. You are worthy. Of now, what's the name? All powerful name, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. with human hands. 
treasure for the trail. No wind has heard, no eye has seen the image of the Father until heaven came to live with me. A rescue like no other. You time you are worthy you are worthy. come on sing it out Celebrate like you love them tonight. Our fight is with weapons 
unseen. Your enemy crash to their knees as we cry out in worship. Thank you, Jesus. When trials unleash like a flood, the battle belongs to our God as we cry.
wants to do something in this moment. Why don't you go ahead and lift your hands and just begin to worship him right where you are. Come on, just make it a private moment with you and God. Come on, make it a private moment with you and God. Come on, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. King of kings. Come on, sing the victory. Come on and worship them tonight. Thank you. God, the victory is yours, God. Oh, God, and because you're victorious, we claim victory tonight, God. Hallelujah! God, tonight, God, we thank you for victory, Lord God, in all areas of our life, Lord God. We thank you, God, for just God, being with us, God, as we worship God these three days, Lord God. Oh, God, we love you, God. We give you the adoration, God. We're careful to give you the praise, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen. Amen. Be seated for just a moment. It's a little hesitation in running up to the stage. I, uh, found out not too long ago that baby number four is on the way. Hallelujah. So there you go. Yeah, my mind is all over the place. Uh, you know, I love that, you know, we get to praise and worship. We get to come together as family. But I think every once in a while we got to have a little fun in church. Amen. You know, there are just some things that are funny in church. And if you don't think so, maybe the joke's on you. Huh? You know, after my wife told me that baby number four is on the way, she looked at me and she said, now one of us is going to get fixed and it ain't going to be me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, there are just so many ways in which the Lord gives back to us. Now, we also, my family knows the pain of miscarriage, but we also know the goodness of God with four healthy children as well. I, yeah. When we give, there is something about seed, time, and harvest that's real. And the beautiful thing is, hey, just like God takes care of the birds of the air, reminded in Scripture how the birds do not have to worry about what they will eat or where they will sleep. How much more then will he take care of you and me? That's right from the Scriptures. Now, I know that we've been giving. I know that we will continue to give, but there's something about us trusting God with it all, my friends, that over time, it comes back. It comes back more than we planted, and it comes back later, but here's the deal. It comes back at just the right time when you need it the most. Amen? So as the ushers make their way forth, we're going to pray. Father, thank you so much that we have an opportunity to not only give but, Lord, we get to sow into other lives. I know what it means to be a recipient for a camp scholarship. I know what it means to earn a scholarship to pay for college. And, Lord, I know that many people have sacrificed and given that many like me may have an opportunity to continue to spread your word. Father, as we invest tonight, we know that you will take care of us, not because we're good, but because you're good. Yeah. And you remind us that you take care of your children. Thank you that you take care of us, your kids. We believe it and we receive it. And it's in your matchless name. Amen and amen.
Right now, Brother Drone is very nervous. Um, we've got something planned this evening that we just want to show some expressions of gratitude. Yeah, there you go. Prepare yourself, folks. John Loper. Loper. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you. Yeah. Listen here. Do you know where you're at right now? Uh, listen, I'm going to tell you where I've been. What? <laughs> okay. So I heard 
Y'all giving away special privilege. And I want to go. <laughs> yeah. I need to go. <laughs> so listen, I want you to know I'm ready. Good. I have on my swim dress. Wonderful. Because modest is hottest. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mess my hair up. Has anybody ever told you you were a tall, fine drink of water? <laughs> this right here is a silver careful, cross. Careful, 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 careful. <laughs> You're pretty to look at. Listen, in here, I've got, I got my SPF. Because <laughs> where, where I heard where he's going, it's hot. Yeah. There's a lot of sun, so I brought my 4,000 SPF. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. That's a high number. <laughs> and then I brought my shirt for my love of my life. Got a picture of my life. Matthew, I love you. <laughs> I will. I'll hold anything you need. Yeah, sure. So I heard on my shell phone he's close by, so I have to. I'm in a hurry. Good, that's okay. What were you going to, hold on. It's my, my tippy cup from the world. Good. What were you going to tell me? I, I was just going to tell you we're at the district council and this is. What's that? Yeah, it's the district council. Are they council. to go too? Yeah, well, not all of them. special trip. <laughs> well, we all wish we could go. What, what, who, what's, the, what's the council? The district councils of the Assemblies of God, you know, it's the 104th uh, event we've had. Oh. Back in Mobile again, oh. wonderful. Oh. That's true. My phone should have exploded. <laughs> I didn't know. Oh, my goodness. Gussie, hold on a minute. Oh. Glory be. <laughs> Glory be. <laughs> Look at this purple and black in here. It's like a buffet of pimps and mints. <laughs> People who are going, if you do me a solid, let them know I gave them these. I will. And, and let them know because I know now because I've seen the sign. It opened up my eyes. I saw it. It's right there. <laughs> we're family. And you don't leave family behind. That's right. <laughs> you hear me? I am ready. At your back and call, you just let me know. <laughs> Multiple. Uh, that's going to that's gonna bankrupt the district, but that's okay. We'll, we'll okay. all go. <laughs> and I am a mission field. Okay. I'm going to go because I'm going to lose the love of my life. All right. Good enough. Give her a hand. Well, if I can find a place to lay all this. Brother Michael, will you come join me just a second? Uh, <laughs> hey, listen. I'm not going to be up here by myself. Believe me, Michael. We're going to share in this together. Uh, here, i got to put this bathing suit someplace. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to put it on. I'm not going to put it on. That's the last thing I'm going to do, David. Um. You know, there's been a lot of honors that have been bestowed this week. Hasn't this been a great council? i, I got to be honest with you. I, I've enjoyed every council I've experienced, and I've experienced a lot of them. But this council has been absolutely awesome from the first night and even to the night. It's been incredible. It's been mentioned several times that the Alabama district has a culture of honoring those who serve us. And I believe God blesses a district that does that. I believe God blesses a church that does that. When you honor your pastor, God blesses you. When you honor those who serve you. And at this district council, this 104th district council, it marks uh, the 10th anniversary of Brother Drones leading us as our district superintendent. It's actually Cindy's 11th anniversary because she was uh, WM director one year before he was elected 
And if you count the years that he served as our missions director, this, this marks 19 years that Brother Drawn has served the Alabama district. I want you to give him a great big hand, would you? Brother Vint, I'm going to ask if you would get Cindy and join Brother Drone. I'm going to ask that you would join us on the platform right now. Uh, Brother Drone, if you could come. You know what? Uh, I've said this many times. It's more than just a cliche. It's the truth. Any endeavor that you try to accomplish, it all rises and falls on leadership. And God has blessed our district with wonderful leadership in Brother Sister Drawn. Um, I said this to the presbyters not long ago, and I'll say it to you today. Uh, during my tenure with him as one of the executive officers and the assistant superintendent, I want to tell you something. I have absolutely, thoroughly enjoyed working with Brother Drawn. He's been a blessing to my life. And, uh, and I might say working with the executive committee, because Brother Sharp, he, we're blessed to have Brother Sharp in the district office. I want you to give him a hand because we're blessed. <laughs> but on this 10th year anniversary of his superintendency, uh, and to acknowledge a job that's been so well done, we want to honor Brother and Sister Drone with an expression of love. And here's the expression of love that we want to offer. Um, now, some people said they want to make this a mandatory sabbatical, but uh, I, I, when it comes to the superintendent, I don't like the word mandatory. But uh, anyway, here's the special gift that we're offering then. A two-month sabbatical to be taken in increments of no less than three weeks as soon as possible be worked into his schedule. As a part of this sabbatical, as you've already witnessed on the screen and by our visitor tonight. An all expense paid vacation to Hawaii of no less than 10 days or whatever duration greater than, than that 10 days the drones wish to stay. Not two years, but you know. <laughs> Don't get to enjoying it too much. Uh, and this Hawaiian vacation is going to be taken within, the, within the, the weeks of the sabbatical. And he needs to do it as soon as, the, as this calendar year makes it possible. Um, I don't know how many of you know it, but some time ago with the district presbyter, when, when our district superintendent is able to expand his horizons and his education, uh, and his depth of knowledge of ministry and uh, other things, we're blessed by that. And so we helped him begin to pursue his doctorate. And uh, right now, he's on a tight time frame because he's got his dissertation facing him, and he's only got a short, you know, you only have a window to finish that dissertation. So we're encouraging Brother Drawn to finish writing his project dissertation for his doctorate of ministry degree from the uh, Assemblies of God Theological Cemetery, Seminary. And, <laughs> that was just a slight slip of the tongue. <laughs> My son Jason said it that way, so he, he'll let me know. But um, What we don't want, Brother Ken, come here, come up here. Come on over here, Tara. We want you to chill, okay? If you'll put that shirt on, John, I said chill. Yeah, well, we want you to chill. We want you to go to Hawaii, and we want you to enjoy it. But the last thing we want is this dissertation to cause you great concern, because I know you've been pressured by all the 
requirements of the office and the schedule of the office, trying to get all of that done. Just take a break. Take a deep breath. Take time to write and finish that and enjoy your stay in Hawaii. And if everybody agrees with our district press break and giving them this great honor, I want you to stand tonight and I want us to express to the drones how deeply we love them and appreciate them. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor John and Presbytery and this fellowship. We appreciate this. And, uh, you know, I, I said recently to get candidate behind your demand is not enough. You got to get the project in and get it finished. And thank you. Got to jump on that. This is an honor. We thank you. And uh, we may see you later. I promise while we're there, we will not take any dancing lessons. So let me walk you down. <laughs> hey, I tell you what, let's go ahead and do this for all. Okay. Hey, listen, while we're here. That's not good in Mobile with the allergies. Uh, while we're here, we're going to go ahead and take care of a little more business. And please, please, please know how much we appreciate this. And thank you. And now there's some of you who are being ordained tonight. So I can't wait till I'm superintendent. <laughs> what a district we serve. We have a gift basket that uh, we're going to be giving away for those who brought in the gift cards for the missionaries. And has that already been drawn? You've already got the name of the winner. We don't. We don't use the word taking a chance on something. We don't gamble. We cash lots. <laughs> Over $3,000 in gift cards came in. And there's um, still some that's got the mail there's in, so do not forget that. Uh, but we went ahead and drew, and the winner of the basket is Brittany Ingram. Is she here? Okay. Here it is. It's oh, you're in the balcony. Afterwards, we'll take our picture. Yeah. And we're going to move it over here. And also, I want to mention that we have a gathering for the ministers and wives in October. And my department is going to give Joe and Angela Lee a free trip if they want to go. Sorry, I can't send you to Hawaii, but uh, I'll send you to Gatlinburg. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. And let me, let me thank the ministers, too. I don't know that she mentioned that, but we had, a, had one of our pastors, Eddie Sullivan, whose house caught on fire, quite extensive damage. And uh, Cindy, she's kind of the mom of the district, you know. She went around saying, well, hey, we've got to help, help our kids here. So over $2,000 will be sent to the Sullivans to help them to get their stuff back in order. Amen. Now, Brother Vint, is giving away a gun, is that right? Yes, sir. That people signed up for. They didn't take a chance. No, sir. They just signed up for it. Just want to th thank um, Butler First, Brother Scotty Fulcher has donated a gun and paid for it, almost $900 gun, and the winner is, Brother Ken, if you would reach down, it, if you, you want me to get somebody else? And the winner is, you see me after Ken church? Drawn. Ken Drawn. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Who is it? Do you want it? Tony Willis. <laughs> I'm going to step down here for just a moment because we're going to at this time we love to do this tonight when we're celebrating our there's a sheet on this board thank you yes as we are 
laying hands on candidates tonight coming into the ordination. Tonight we have a privilege of celebrating a recipient of a 50th anniversary pen of being ordained for 50 years. Tonight, Reverend Ledkins has served faithfully for over 50 years. He began his ministry. Now, you help me, Brother Ledkins. Is that Elska, Assembly of God in Uri? Aleska. They must have been speaking in tongues when they named that one. In 1964, in 1967, he transferred to the Mississippi District to Pastor Height Assembly of God. Is that Noxa Pater? Well, I did that one. I've got it. Hallelujah. Mississippi, where he served. While in Mississippi, he pastored two other churches, First Assembly of God in Forest, Mississippi, and First Assembly of God in Clark Clarksdale, Mississippi. While pastoring these churches, he also served on the Mississippi Sectional Committee Served as a sectional youth rep for six years. Served as a presbyter in the Mississippi, Mississippi District for two years. And in 1982, Pastor Ledkins transferred back into the Alabama District and pastored Bowles Assembly of God for three years and then went on to pastor Oak Grove Assembly of God, which is his home church until his retirement in 1996. Although retired, Pastor Ledkins continues to be a blessing in his local church as well as preaching in Alabama pulpits where he's in need. Brother Ledkins, would you come and join us here? We would uh, like to present to you. You know, he's 91 years young. I'm going to walk up here without that walking stick. <laughs> I met him at a homecoming at Monroeville. I had so much fun with him. He's such an amazing guy. He said, I'm just getting to talk with the superintendent and begin to tell me all these stories. I'm telling you, this guy is a champ. He, he's a blessing. And do we have the pen? John, do you want to, I'll hold this. If you want to pin him, do not go too far with that needle in. <laughs> yeah. do, do you want me to tell him what yes, I sir. told Come the Lord? Here. here, you take that right. No, you don't take a sermon. You just take that. Tell him what I told the Lord when I thought he's telling me to be a minister. What'd you tell him? I said, Lord, did I hear you right? <laughs> he said, Yeah. Well, I said, Lord, I think everybody's entitled to one mistake, and you just <laughs> made yours. I love it. Lord, you're entitled to one mistake, and you just made yours. <laughs> Could, could I have the general soup come get in this picture? We don't often get to have that, but we'd like our general superintendent to come get in this picture with him. Amen. Congratulations. And his wife was not able to be, but we have flowers for her. His two daughters are with him. I said, take those flowers to your wife and say, look what I brought you. It has been an exciting council to have our general superintendent, Doug Clay, with us. He's a blessing. He's very personable. He's a great communicator. He's an Ohio fan. <laughs> Roll Tide. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, you're here. You're here. I would like for you, he's going to come and share the word tonight, focused at our candidates as well as every minister in the house. Before he steps up here, let me one more time say thank you to the Knollwood team, Pastor Joe and Angela, thank you and your team, Pastor Mark and his team, and all the hospitality that we've been given. You know, we've been able to feel like we were at home in their home. 
and I appreciate that so much. It means so much. So pray for them in the weeks ahead as they put this place back together that we broke. And the Lord would bless them. Let me also say to our district officers, these guys are a blessing. I appreciate them and their leadership. You've seen uh, Pastor John, our assistant superintendent, and Dr. Sharp, our secretary treasurer. You've seen the other guys. I know Vint Norris, our CE director. David Strahan led the mission service, had a great mission service. Uh, where you at? Brother Steve, the short guy in the group, uh, just leading our youth in this district. It's just amazing to see what God is doing among us. And, of course, the best officer, my wife, Cindy, our women's director. Amen. Let me also thank our team, my executive administrative assistant, Tara Russell, for all her help running around and doing things. And all of the team, you know, Sherry's been here with the missions office and everybody pitches in. We've just had a lot of people helping. We appreciate it. It's, you know, you just can't have a family reunion without somebody making way for it. So we appreciate all those. Would you tonight give a hearty Alabama welcome to Pastor Doug Clay? Thanks, buddy. I got this one. Hey, congratulations. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Thanks. Thanks. Please. Yeah, that's good. Good, good. Uh, thank you so much. You can be seated. Wow, what a treat. You know you're in a, a place where there's a lot of unity. Tara Russell, Pastor Ken's administrative assistant, came up to me and said, you know, Sister Glover texted me and said, hey, you've been here 10 years, uh, you should get a gift. <laughs> she said, I did, boss free, two months. <laughs> boss free, two months. Some of you will get that in a few minutes, but uh, it is a privileged opportunity tonight to be a part of this ordination service. It's a, ordination is an opportunity for all of us, family, friends, peers, to recognize God's calling on your life. It's his selection, it's his appointment. Now, I know of the creative, fun-loving nature of your district officers, but I thought, you know, leadership has a trickle-down effect, so before I come to this council, I want to sneak into the general secretary's office and look at some of the answers to the questions on the ordination test that the Alabama candidates took. I've got those with me tonight. Would you like to hear some of them? <clears throat> it certainly reflects leadership, I can tell you that. So one of the ordination candidates to the question that says, do you have a preference for the type of message you preach? Expository, textual, or topical? This candidate said, no, not really. I'm just happy when I get a good one. <laughs> Why is everybody looking at you? What's up with that? Uh, in the eschatological section, one of the questions asked was this. What is your view of tribulation? This candidate replied, pre-trip. Mid-trip, post-trip, it's just important that you make the trip. <laughs> but I think my favorite answer of all comes to the question, <clears throat> can you briefly, briefly explain the Assemblies of God's position as to divorce and remarried persons? This Alabama candidate said, in the assemblies of God, we prefer the former spouse to be dead. <laughs> hey, that's your class of 2019 right there, huh? I love it. I love it. just having fun with you. Ordination, man, it's fun. Jesus said in John 15, 
You didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. For those of you who may be guests or family members tonight, there are really three primary functions to an ordination service. First of all, there's a physical action. In other words, in a few moments, we're going to be laying hands on these candidates. That's the centerpiece of an ordination service. It's a symbolic action that uh, has biblical precedence. You have Jacob blessing Joseph's two sons by laying his hands on them. You have Moses ordaining Joshua by laying his hands. You have the deacons in the early church uh, commissioning the apostles. So there's a physical action. There's also group participation in an ordination service. You and I, we're here. We're here to recognize the call of God on their life. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.15, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them. Now watch this. So that everyone may see your progress. We're here tonight to recognize the progress of ministry in your life. You see, we're not only, all of us, accountable to God. We're accountable to one another as it relates to our calling. We're accountable to each other so that everyone will see our progress. And then the third activity or the third um, function of an ordination service is um, spiritual impartation. Just spiritual impartation. In other words, in a few moments when the leadership lays their hands on you and we in this audience begin to pray we are going to pray a prayer that believes God to double portion you with his anointing that you'll begin to feel Zechariah 4 6 it's not by might it's not by power but by my spirit saith the Lord your ordination is not about status it's not about position it's not about a denominational obligation it's commissioning you to have an anointing of the Holy Spirit to be an agent of reconciliation in your calling. And I would tell you, ministry was never intended to be an option, uh, uh, an occupation. It's a calling. It's a privileged opportunity to be in the ministry. Well, there's a lot of models for ministry in the world today. There's a lot of churches that market their model for ministry. They're good models. But for our candidates tonight, I wanted to choose Jesus as a model for ministry and just take a snapshot at one day in his life and see if in that one day in his life we can pick up some things about ministry that are worth emulating in our ministry. I invite you, if you have your copy of God's Word, to turn with me to Luke chapter 4 as we take a snapshot into the day in the life of Christ's ministry. Now, don't ever forget the Gospels, they were given to us, right, not just to validate Christ's virgin birth, not to validate his death and resurrection. The Gospels were given to us to show us how he carried out his ministry. And when you come to Luke chapter 4, we get a nice glimpse of a one day in the life of Christ's ministry. Beginning in verse 31, then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee on the Sabbath. He taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Now in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said. He said it sternly. Come out of him. And the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people, watch this, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. And with authority and with power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the this, this surrounding region. Just taking that snapshot of Christ's ministry, there are three things that I think are worth emulating for you, ordination candidates, for all of us who are celebrating the call of God in our life tonight. First of all, notice Jesus' authoritative teaching. In other words, he used the right words. 
The Bible says in verse 32, they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. And I would submit to you tonight that Christ believed in the power of God's word. See, the truth is, our natural words have very little impact on people, but God's word has transformational impact on people. You say, Pastor Clay, do you really believe that strong in God's word? I do. I do for the following reasons. Number one, the Bible is God's perfect revelation to us. In other words, we believe every word in the Bible can be trusted. All scripture is God-breathed and he doesn't suffer from bad breath. For prophecy never had its origin, Peter writes, in the human will. But prophets, through humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That means scripture was initiated by God. Yes, man was used to write it down. But God moved on man's heart to carry it out. And you can be assured that when you use the word of God, there are no errors. It is divinely inspired. It is the perfect revelation of God. It's not just the perfect revelation. It's also um, the complete or the sufficient revelation to us. Some people will say, well, you know, I get it. I believe that the Bible is God's word and all, but how do I really know God's not going to continue to give some new or fresh revelations of divine inspiration? Well, you have to go no farther than Jude, verse 3. Jude writes, dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you, listen, to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. In other words, there's this body of truth, doctrine called the faith. It's been entrusted or delivered. That's a past tense. In other words, the action has already happened once and for all. So I got great news for us tonight. God is not giving any new canonical information about himself. Everything you need to know about heaven, about hell, about life, about the Holy Spirit can be found in God's word. That's why as Pentecostal ministers, we've got to remain word-based, word-centered. Because the Bible is not only God's perfect revelation, it's also the complete and sufficient but perhaps the most important part of God's word is this. The Bible is God's living revelation. This is one of the most important aspects of the word of God. For 2,000 years, God's people have been coming together, gathering together in houses of worship to listen to the word of God. Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit. It's active. In other words, it's full of energy. And don't you dare ever think for a moment that the Bible is some bulk rate piece of mail addressed to an impersonal resident. It's a first class piece of information directed to help us change people's lives. And when you use the word of God correctly, when you use the word of God correctly, it's helpful, it's profitable, it's transformational. But when you use the word of God incorrectly, it's incredibly dangerous. That's why it's important to understand the power. Jesus used the right word. You see, the combustion of the energy of God's word comes when we use it appropriately. But the destruction comes when we use it inappropriately. I suspect I learned this lesson as a 10-year-old boy. I've shared bits and pieces of my testimony throughout our time together, but when I was nine years old, my dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack. But because of a loving pastor, a great church, I never really felt the negative impact. Bill Leach, who was 21 years old, became the pastor at the time. They didn't have any children, and so just kind of adopted me. And one of the fun things I used to enjoy doing with Pastor Leach was on Sunday night, whenever we would have a guest come and preach, he would take me to go out to eat with that guest. And I could always tell the type of guest that we'd be. If it was a school buddy that we, he was having come and preach, we'd go back to his house, Sister Leach would, would prepare some food, and we'd have fun. 
If it was somebody he didn't know, you know, we'd probably go to Pizza Bucket. It was about the, one of only two establishments opened on Sunday night. We'd hang out in Pizza Bucket. But if it was a big shooter, I mean, if it was an important person, we would go to Big Boy. Frisch's Big Boy. My dad had been uh, passed away for about a year, and Pastor Leach had a pretty high-profile, well-known evangelist come to church. If I mentioned his name, probably the majority of the people in this room would know it. He preached a very prosperity type of a message. He had an entourage. It was high-profile, and he came and was holding some revival services, and he preached kind of that hyper-faith type of a message. And I'll never forget on Sunday night when we went out to eat, and I used to love doing that. I, I'd set out to eat, and, and I would sit in that booth and watch the pastor and the guests talk. And I'll never forget when this evangelist looked at Brother Leach and said, You know, Reverend, the reason why Art Clay, that was my dad, the reason why Art Clay died a premature death, well, there must have been either sin in his life or it was a lack of his wife's faith. that took him at a premature age. And I vividly remember turning and looking and like only a godly pastor could do, Pastor Leach quickly changed the conversation. When that evening a fellowship drew to a close, Pastor Leach said, Duggar, I want you to ride home with me. And we got into that Chevy Impala that had uh, bench seats and he put the armrest down he said I want you to sit right here and I plopped up on that armrest and he threw his arm around me and for about a 15 minute ride home he said Doug I know you heard something tonight at Big Boy and you heard it come from a minister but I want you to know that's not true and he began to walk out with me scriptures about it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment that our life and times our seasons and our seasons are in his hands and for 12 minutes I had a godly pastor unpack some truths about scripture where someone else had used it grossly wrong God never gave us the Bible to make us smarter sinners. He gave us the Word of God to change our lives. So I want to encourage you in your ministry, whether you're in student ministries, whether you're in church planning or missions ministry, let's follow Jesus' patterns. Let's use the right words. Let's let our teaching be authoritative because it's using the Word of God. There's a second aspect of Jesus's ministry that I think is worth looking at and that's this his supernatural power the supernatural power of Jesus in other words there were tangible results when Jesus ministered when Christ taught when Christ ministered things happen can I just say to all of us in the room if uh, if people are non-responsive and unmoved by our teaching don't blame it on their ethnicity why don't you check the anointing gauge Christ's ministry, not only, watch this, not only were the people amazed, the demons were amazed too. Verse 33, in the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, go away, what do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, you're the Holy One of God. Hey, what you've got here is you, you've got a man who's demon possessed. The demon speaks through the man. Christ casts the demon out. And I find it interesting that the demon understands more of what's going on than what the people do. The demon knew that he was the Messiah. That he was the Son of God. Say, Pastor Clay, what's your point? Just knowing the right stuff about Jesus doesn't guarantee the anointing. Just having the right homiletics doesn't guarantee the anointing. Just having the right strategic plan, even if you were consulted by a Christian consultant, doesn't guarantee the anointing. 
And if you'll let me, please, it's not because it's a company line, it's a conviction in my heart. I want to talk to you about the anointing. Because not everybody really shares the same understanding of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For example, my mom. My mom's kind of old school. She's 87 years old, and she's, uh, she's full of life and all of that. And when I was growing up, when I was growing up on Sunday mornings, we couldn't watch cartoons. Uh, we could listen to revival time, you know, across the nation and around the world. It's revival time. Or do you remember that cartoon, Davy and Goliath, the little claymation figures? Hey, Davy, you know, we could watch it. But other than that, we could, Sunday morning was sacred. Well, I was district superintendent in Ohio. I had to, I had to do one of those um, unpleasant, <laughs> unpleasant functions of telling the church on a Sunday morning their pastor had, had a hiccup and would no longer be their pastor. And it was in the northwest part of Ohio. So uh, whenever I was in the northwest part of Ohio, I would always go up and stay with my mom. My mom lived in Adrian, Michigan. And so uh, I met with the board that Saturday night, went up to st spent the night with my mom. and. And on Sunday morning, I got up, and uh, I, I had the routine. I knew the announcement I was going to make to the church. I was going to go in there. And it was in the fall. And like you in the fall, I have a, an interest in how my favorite teams are doing. So I slipped down into the TV room, and, and I turned on the television. I went to ESPN. I wanted to get updated on how all my teams did that morning. So... District Superintendent of Ohio in my house watching ESPN, and all of a sudden, my mom, you know where I'm, she comes into that room, she grabs that clicker out of my hand, she flips it to WLMV, the Christian television station from Toledo, Ohio. About the time she flipped over there, T.D. Jakes was on a roll, talking about, get ready, get ready, get ready to walk through your door of destiny, and he was going on, and my mom said, honey, if more of your ministers had that kind of an anointing, you wouldn't have to do what you're doing today. Now let's pray for God's anointing on your ministry. <laughs> Boom, laid me out right there. So I don't know if speed and intensity is the anointing, but candidates, here's what I would submit to you. The anointing is supernatural assistance to help you do what you can't do on your own. Just supernatural assistance to help you do ministry effectively, to help you do in ministry what you can't do on your own. And can I submit to you, there's a lot of reasons, but there's two primary reasons why you need the anointing in your ministry. And the reason why Jesus did is because demons are real and discouragement is real. Jesus encountered demonic activity and he needed the Holy Spirit. Time doesn't permit me to unpack all of this. And I'm not, I don't, I don't give the devil higher priority than what he needs or attention. But I can tell you, you will face devilish opposition in your calling. You'll face emotional discouragement. And it's in those times you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring back to your mind that when you cry out, to God, God will hear you and he will rescue you. You can cry out to the Lord and he will hear you and rescue you. And, and there is no one better that's taught me the lesson of rescue than again my grandson Jackson. It was a year ago December that Jackson um, FaceTimed me. I love grandparenting. One of the things that amazed me about grandkids is how at an early age they know how to use this device right here. I mean, Jackson knows how to FaceTime me, and whenever I see a FaceTime call coming in from my daughter's phone, I usually know it's Jackson. The FaceTime call goes something like this. I hit the yellow or the red button, and I said, Jackson, how are you? Papa, how are you? And he takes the phone from his mom's hand, and he runs into his bedroom, and he shows me all the dinosaurs that are lined up in the windowsill, and then he shows me his Spider-Man uh, uh, outfits, and then he turns around, and I can only see half of his face. And we have this wonderful conversation, FaceTime. A year ago, December, my daughter, Jackson's mom, my firstborn daughter, got it in her mind that she could help Jackson's attention span by changing his diet. 
So my daughter, my firstborn daughter, in the month of December, decided to put my five-year-old grandson at that time on a vegan, gluten-free diet. Oh. Woman, you are out of order. I'm just telling you right now. Cheesy grits, fried catfish, sweet tea, roll tie. <laughs> but dad, I want you to support me in this. Mom and dad, I want you to support me in this. So, all right, it's December. Come on. Would you rather have avocados in a blender or homemade peanut butter fudge during the holiday? I'll support. So, I, so you know, it's December. So December 22nd, I get this FaceTime call from Jackson. And I'm thinking, oh, he survived a visit at the, uh, to visit Santa Claus, or maybe he got a new toy. And so I hit the red button, and I said, hey, little buddy, how are you? And he said, Papa. On the other end of the line, there was this sad, starving face of a five-year-old little boy. <laughs> Papa, Papa, I don't want to FaceTime you. Rescue me, Papa, rescue me. Well, I knew exactly what that meant. I said, little buddy, I'll be right there. I jumped in my truck. I went over. I got him. I plopped him in the front seat. We went through the drive through of Sonic. I got some loaded cheesy fries, a large strawberry Terminator limeade, and I was rescuing my grandson from that bondage diet, vegan, gluten-free. When Jackson was faced with a situation that was out of his control, he couldn't control, and he didn't have the resources to do anything about it, he called on Papa. He called on Papa. I'm telling you, sometimes in the ministry, we just need to cry out to God. And in your distress, he'll hear you. In your low times, he'll hear you. Because he didn't call you to just wind you up and let you do ministry on your own. He desires to give you supernatural assistance to do what you otherwise can't do on your own. Supernatural power. Well, there's one final thought as it relates to um, the life of Jesus. Just one day in the life of Jesus. You see the authoritative teaching, to use the right word. You see the supernatural power, there were tangible results. But I'd also encourage you that in the life of Jesus, you always see genuine compassion. In other words, he kept people at the center of his calling. He kept people. And for all of us, I would remind us that the best way to grow in compassion for people is to see people how Jesus sees people. And there's probably no better illustration on how Jesus sees people than in the story he told of the Good Samaritan. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? It's a fascinating story that reveals people's motives and their intent about compassion. I mean, you've got the lawyer in the story. He's the expert in religious law. He only saw compassion as a subject to debate or as an issue to explore because he asked Jesus questions to, with answers that he already knew. Then you see the robbers, they took advantage of the situation for their own good. How many of us have seen people put a fish on their business card, but they don't operate their business like Jesus? Then you have the priest and the temple assistants. They were kind of the spiritual leaders of the day, but they avoided the situation altogether because if they would have got involved, they would have forfeited their internship up at the temple. And then... Jesus introduces us to the Good Samaritan. And for the Good Samaritan, compassion wasn't a subject to debate. It wasn't an issue to avoid. It was an op wasn't an opportunity for personal gain. For the Good Samaritan, compassion was all about getting involved. Compassion to Jesus was a verb. It wasn't a noun. And like the Good Samaritan... Jesus 
saw and felt the needs of other people while he was here on earth. And I would submit to you that the secret to compassion is not found in your website. It's not found in your daily tweets. It's not found in blogs that you write. The secret to compassion is getting involved with people. In Matthew's parable account, he quotes Isaiah, is that he would carry, he would carry our sicknesses and remove our disease. Ministry is all about carrying people's burdens. You get the wonderful privilege in coming weeks and days to walk with people through some of the greatest highs in their life and to walk with people through some of the greatest lows in their life. But here's what I'm going to ask you. Don't ever view people that you're called to lead as a means to an end. They're the whole reason why you said yes to going into ministry. So let the Lord allow you to develop genuine compassion for the people you lead by just learning how to see people like Jesus sees people. The right words, authoritative teaching, tangible results through supernatural power, and keeping people at the center. Genuine, genuine compassion. The model for ministry is Jesus. A lot of great models that you can study and look at, but when it comes to the model for effective, effective ministry, let's keep our eyes on Jesus. So congratulations, ordination class of 2019. And as an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God, I challenge you with these final thoughts. Number one, please God. Please God. Make your first and foremost priority be that of pleasing God. Secondly, remember you're called to serve people. They're not numbers, they're souls. Thirdly, lead with courage. Lead with courage. Depend on God's wisdom when it comes to making difficult choices. Fourth, Take responsibility for your own life and your own actions so that others may see your progress. And finally, just lead like Jesus. Lead like Jesus. Use the word. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Fall in love with the people that you're called to lead. You see, because as I study Jesus' life, authority comes from Scripture. The anointing comes from the Spirit, but your authenticity will come from your humility and your dependency on the Lord. So congratulations. On behalf of the Assemblies of God USA, we welcome you into this network of ordained ministers. God bless you. Thank you so much, Brother Clay. Tonight we come to a very solemn time in our service. I think the crowning of the whole council is the ordination service. And tonight we're going to begin this, but let me say, it's my privilege, 40 years ago, at the old AG campgrounds in Montgomery, the last council there that Bernard Johnson preached, I was ordained, right out of CBC and AGTS seminary. Forty years, this council, my son has been ordained tonight. Now, let me tell you what's unique. Didn't know this would happen, and this isn't about me. It's about you guys. Howard Reynolds, who was the DYD, had just been voted in at that council, laid hands on me to ordain me. He's here tonight, and he's going to come up and stand behind 
my son. It's just a unique moment for me. Thank you, Howard. I want to ask uh, Dr. Michael Sharp to come, and we're going to begin our ordination service. And when we come back for the charge, rather than me leading the charge as I have for these last years, I've asked our general superintendent, who outranks me anyway, to lead the charge tonight, which is unique for me, so that I can lay hands on my son as he's ordained into the ministry. Brother Sharp. could have our district presbytery to come and stand across the front. As I call the candidates' names, if you would stand and come. Stand in front of the presbyter to which you have been assigned. If your spouse could come with you, stand behind you. Marlene Lene Kraft. Derek Kendall Gaughan. John Bradley Galliard. Mandy Thrasher Perkins. Rusty Lynn Perkins. Her husband comes with her. They are both being ordained tonight. Patricia. Dawn Pearson. Edward Philip Rayburn. Angel Rodriguez. Andrea Opal Sprinkle. Wesley Stephen Stanley. Would those who have been approved to come and stand behind these candidates come at this time and stand behind them. Brother Clay. Congratulations, uh, ordination class of 2019. Uh, you've reached the significant pinnacle of ministerial recognition, and it's a privilege for us, as spiritual elders, family, and friends, to recognize that. You've qualified for ordination by completing required studies, by, rece by receiving the approval of your district presbytery, and by having a proven ministry. We recognize the call of God in your life, and we 
recommend this request for ordination to the general council. The general council credentials committee in turn has acted in favor on the request from the Alabama district. And so tonight is a great moment in your life and in the life of this district receiving you into its family. You know, you already know this, there will be challenges in you, as you serve the Lord in gospel ministry. As I already mentioned, you're going to face demonic oppression. You'll face emotional highs and lows. You'll be called to bear burdens that you, always, that you just cannot share, even with your closest friends. Your family might be exposed to some unfair criticism from people who are determined to harm your ministry. Your heart may ache over some of the sour, sorrow and waywardness of the people of your flock. You may be called to suffer for holding up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a community. But there's another side of this. You get to rejoice on a regular basis over new names being written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You get the thrill of operating under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and watching Him accomplish great things. You get to see God's hand make a way in times where there seems to be no possible way. And with faith, you'll become invincible until you've completed this assignment that God has given you. The Apostle Paul gave this charge to Timothy, and so now I want to offer it to you. I charge you, therefore, before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they'll heap, them, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and having turned away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things and endure, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. And as Elisha received the mantle from Elijah, this stole is now being placed on you by the presbytery as a symbol. <laughs> it's a symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. May it represent the uniqueness of the supernatural assistance that comes from the Holy Spirit being on you tonight. So now it's my wonderful privilege as a general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in this 2019 Alabama District Council to ordain you into the ministry of the Assemblies of God. Never again to walk as others walk for from this time forward, you are God's servant set aside for his special work, which we recognize today. I want to ask those who've been approved to join the candidates in prayer. I believe you're all here to come. Now, candidates, I'm going to ask if you would kneel. And elders and leaders and congregations, friends and family, as the elders lay their hands on them, would you extend your hand this way? And if you're comfortable, out loud, begin to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for the dunamis power that comes from on high. Let's pray in such a way that these candidates will never, never forget this critical moment in their lives. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Father in heaven, we rejoice in what you've done in the lives of these being ordained tonight. We recognize and celebrate your calling on their lives. Tonight, Lord, they stand on the threshold of a lifetime of ministry. And our sincere prayer, Lord, is that they'll you, you will use them beyond their highest expectations that they will know that you're able to do far more abundantly above beyond what they can ask or think according to the power that's at work in them. Tonight, Lord, we thank you for parents and grandparents and spouses and children and pastors and mentors and godly influences in their lives that have prepared them uniquely for the ministry to which you've called them and are ordaining them to tonight. Lord, I pray that each one of them will strive to have the purest of motives on this God-guided adventure of ministry. May they shine their lights in the mix of a darkened culture. Use them with increasing effectiveness to display your glory. Oh God, we're excited to think how desperately they are needed in the field of harvest. Ministers who are committed to the gospel of grace, may they constantly be learning the power of prayer and the value of the anointing. So Father, as our shepherd, would you go before them and lead them in a plain path to do your will and to do it courageously. Keep them from sin and their success. Prevent them from believing their own press. And help them to grow in a spirit of humility. So that, Lord, your grace can be evident in the body of Christ. Now, Lord, reproduce in each individual the heart of Christ, the life of Christ, and the mind of Christ, I pray, to be agents of reconciliation to this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Candidates, I'm going to ask that you would stand. And as you turn and as you face your family and your friends and your peers, congregation, can we acknowledge the work of God's grace in each one of these candidates' lives tonight? <laughs> Candidates, as we call your name, if you would, go to that end of the stage, come up, receive your ordination certificate and card, exit on that side of the stage, and return to your place in line. Marlene Lene Kraft. Marlene attended Evangel University with a major in communications. She completed courses for ordination with the Alabama School of Ministry in 2018. She currently serves as an appointed U.S. missionary to widows. 
Arlene is the widow of Reverend Wayne Craft, has two sons who are here tonight, two daughters-in-law and two grandchildren. Her plans are to continue as a U.S. missionary to widows, connecting them to the Lord and each other through small groups, retreats, and cruises. She is writing a small group program to equip churches to minister to widows in their community. Marlene Kraft. Amen. Derek Kendall Drawn, a native of Mobile, Alabama. Derek has previously served other churches as youth pastor and lead pastor. He presently serves as lead pastor of Sarah Land First Assembly of God, a dynamic and growing church in the Mobile metropolitan area. Derek did his coursework through Berean School of the Bible. Derek is an adventurous man and a licensed pilot. He is married to Courtney, who is a licensed minister as well, and they have three sons. Derek Drawn. John Bradley Galliard. Brad graduated from Southeastern University in 2012 with a degree in church ministries. He presently serves as youth pastor at Tuscaloosa First Assembly with lead pastor Charles Lynn. He plans to continue youth ministry for many years, but hopes someday to become a lead pastor. He is married to Lacey, and they have two daughters, Brad Galliard. <laughs> Mandy Thrasher Perkins and her husband, Rusty Lynn Perkins, both ordained tonight. Mandy Thrasher Perkins completed her coursework for ordination in 2015 through the Alabama School of Ministry. She serves as a co-youth pastor at New Beginnings Assembly of God with Pastor Barbara Trussell. She plans to continue youth ministry for a season and perhaps someday become a lead co-pastor with her husband, Rusty, as God leads. She and Rusty have two sons and one daughter, Mandy Thrasher Perkins. Amen. Rusty Lynn Perkins. Rusty completed his studies for ordination in 2015 from the Alabama School of Ministry. He currently serves as co-youth pastor at New Beginnings Assembly of God with lead pastor Barbara Trussell. His plans are to continue youth ministry and someday serve as lead co-pastor with his wife, Mandy, in God's time. He and Mandy have two sons and one daughter, Rusty Lynn Perkins. <laughs> Patricia Dawn Pearson. Trish graduated from Southeastern University in 1992 with a bachelor's in secondary English education. She serves as children's pastor at Life Church in Rainbow City with lead pastor Keith Fricks. Trish plans to continue children's ministry until God calls her into some other kind of ministry. You may recognize Trish from Springville Camp, where she's worked for many years alongside her husband, Reverend Kevin Pearson, who is the director of Springville Camp and Conference Center. Trish has two daughters, one son-in-law, and a grandchild on the way. Trish Pearson. Edward Philip Rayburn. Philip began his coursework with Berean and completed his studies for ordination in 2018 through the Alabama School of Ministry. He currently serves as lead pastor at Westview Assembly of God. His plans are to continue the work he loves, which is pastoring until the Lord returns. He and his wife, Jane, have been married 52 years. They have one daughter and son-in-law, one son and daughter-in-law, and four grandchildren. Edward Philip Rayburn. Angel Rodriguez. Angel completed his studies for ordination in 2018 through Alabama School of Ministry. He previously earned a degree in marketing with a minor in international relations from St. John's University and a Juris Doctor Law degree from the City University of New York Law School. He currently serves as interim lead pastor at Trinity Assembly of God in Sylacauga and chairman of the board of Alabama Teen Challenge. He plans to plant an Assemblies of God church in the village of Ross, West Coast, Berbice, Guyana, South America, and to continue as chairman of board of Teen Challenge. His long-term plans include earning a master's degree in theology or biblical studies, such as global theology. He is married to Oslin, and they have three sons and one daughter, Angel Rodriguez.
Andrea Opal Sprinkle. Andrea completed her course coursework for ordination in 2017 from the Alabama School of Ministry. She currently serves in children's ministry at Irvington Assembly of God with Pastor Clarence Ramsey. Her desire is to evangelize through preaching, ministering to children in both her home church and other churches. She would like to serve full time as a children's and youth pastor, possibly becoming a lead pastor someday. She's married to Patrick and they have one daughter, Andrea Opal Sprinkle. Wesley Stephen Stanley. Wes completed his studies for ordination through Berean School of the Bible in 2017. He is currently serving as children's pastor at City Church in Dothan with lead pastor Seth Martin. His plans are to continue as children's pastor as long as God will allow. Wesley is married to Tanya and they have two daughters and one son, Wesley Stephen Stanley. This is the ordination class for the Alabama District of 2019. God bless them. Would you stand with us this evening? Would you join me? Let's give God praise for being with us. Hallelujah. Please take time to meet our newest ordain ordained ministers of the Assemblies of God. We now conclude this council. Go home, drive carefully.